Welcome to Career Tipper Podcast, hosted by Michelle Beatty. The Career Tipper Podcast is a motivational resource that shares career and entrepreneurial tips by industry experts that will help amazing people evolve to their professional best. And now your host, Michelle Beatty. Episode 57 of the Career Tipper Podcast is from our Archives Vault that features the original voice of Apple's Siri, Susan Bennett. Her voice talent is the persona on devices worldwide. Susan not only gives directions, she greets passengers at Delta Gates worldwide, helps people discover better ingredients in pizza, and makes the mission possible. During this episode, Susan chats about the lessons that she has learned along her journey to accidental fame how technology has transformed the industry, and how she keeps her skills recharged. I'm your host, Michelle Beatty, professional development author and coach. Susan, welcome, and thank you for joining the Career Tipper podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Michelle. Oh, my goodness. Susan, please tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. I'm so excited to have you on the show. (laughs) Well, I am a singer, musician, and voice actor, and I'm probably best known as the original voice of Siri. Yay! (laughs) (laughs) What started you on your journey to become a voice actor? Well, I got into it accidentally. Um, It was kind of strange. I used to do a lot of jingle singing because I started off in this wacky business as a singer, and... um, This was an actual career uh, back in the 70s and 80s, and I used to sing jingles a lot and uh, and with other singers as well. And one day, the voice actor didn't show up for whatever reason to read the copy of the spot that we were singing for. So the owner of the studio said, Susan, you don't have an accent. Come over here and read this copy. (laughs) And I did. And a little bell went off. Ding, ding, ding. I can do this. So I got a voice coach and then a, a... talent agent, and I've been working ever since. Oh, that's awesome. Now, how long have you been a singer? Oh, I've been a singer. I I didn't really, I've been playing the piano since I was four, actually, but um, I didn't really get into singing until high school, and then I started singing professionally in college, and have been singing professionally ever since as well. (laughs) So the singing and the voice acting went together hand in hand. I hear you. I hear you. Who have you learned the most from from about developing your craft? Well, um, I guess, you know, my original voice coach was a guy in a uh, well, well-known actor in Atlanta named Stuart Culpepper, and he helped a lot. But to tell you the truth, I, I learned a lot just by doing and uh, by, by doing a lot of different types of sessions. Now, you have to keep in mind that I started this in this business decades ago, and so it's very different from what it is today. Today, there are voiceover conferences, and there are voiceover coaches, and, and all that sort of thing. And in the, in, when I started, you know, no one ever really thought of voiceover as a career. It was sort of an extension of uh, an acting job. or You know, it was you, you were an actor, and you did some voiceover work. And now it's really become a thing, you know, so that it's it's a really popular thing. And, and as a result, lots and lots of people are doing it and want to do it. So do you get approached often from people, please help me or can you please well, mentor me? Well, I get a few of those and I don't really do much coaching. Um, I'm happy to consult, you know, on a one-time basis. Um, but basically when people reach out to me, I've put together a doc that tells people, you know, what I think they ought to do to really get in the business. Um, It's much easier and much less expensive now than it was years ago. I built, you know, a home studio from scratch. And nowadays, if you have an iPhone and a mixer face and a microphone and a good quiet closet, you've got a studio. (laughs) So things have really, really changed. Technology has revolutionized my business. That's awesome. Who inspires Susan Bennett? Well, I'd have to say probably um, I'm most inspired by actors more so than voiceover actors because in many cases I don't really know 
voiceover actors. Um, you know, a lot of times we are all working from our own home booths at this point for the most part. And so we don't really get to interact all that much unless we do participate in a lot of the different voiceover conferences that are going on throughout the country. Um, so I would have to say that I'm just very inspired by, by people that are, that are very, you know, that are talented, that work hard. And, um, and of course, I'm always inspired by people that, that can have a, a, a wide range of ability, of course, of the Meryl Streeps of the world. But uh, just individually speaking, as far as a voiceover person, I can't really say any one person, but I do notice a lot of wonderful voices just, you know, on radio and TV, mm-hmm. who's, you know, people whose names I don't even know. So, you know, there, there's inspiration everywhere. That's true. You just have to be on the lookout for it. How has flexibility been an asset to you in your career? Well, I think any person who is a freelancer, um, especially in this type of you know business, show business, I guess, um, it really is very helpful to be as versatile and diverse as you can possibly be. Um, because as we all know, you have to work very hard to even get a job sometimes. And uh, there are a lot of people out there competing for the same thing that you're competing for. And so consequently, you, you know, the, the more you can do and the more versatile you are, the more opportunities you'll have to actually get hired. <laughs> so, so it's very good to be flexible. It's also fun to be flexible. And uh, even though we don't have the comfort of a regular um, paycheck, coming our way, you know, like those people who work for, you know, companies and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, we don't have that security, but we do have the uh, advantage of having an, usually an interesting job, you know, every day. No, I totally hear you. Um, what are some of the different roles that you've had for voiceover? Cause I, enjoyed listening to your not listening but watching your TED talk and you did an array of different voices like Macy's and Santa Claus and just different things so I'm just curious to know which do you have any favorites other than Siri of course one would assume but are there any others that you enjoy doing well I have two favorites one is uh, event planner Shaka Cohen that I did on the TED Talk. And no one wants her, though. I've never been hired as Shaka. She kind of talks like this, still, you know. <laughs> I love her, but no one else seems to. <laughs> but the other one, I would have to say, the highlight of my entire career was the singing chicken. What? Yeah, singing chicken for Zeneca Agricultural Products. (laughs) Yes, that was a true spot. I mean, that really did happen, and it was a lot of fun. (laughs) Um, Have you done cartoons? No, I wish, but I'll tell you, um, the Center for Animation is Los Angeles. I live on the opposite end of, uh, opposite side of the country, and from what I understand, there is such a talented core group of people that do most of the animation work in Los Angeles. It's, uh, from what I understand, it's a very difficult thing to break into, and of course, they use a lot of celebrities now, so um, I've had the good fortune of being able to do a lot of different crazy voices, you know, advertising goes through different cycles. And when I was doing tons and tons and tons of radio and TV stuff, they, you know, they, they would play with a lot of crazy characters. So I got to do a lot of characters in, at that time. And I've been able to do, I, I'm the voice, I'm, I do three voices on a little website called clauskids.com, which is a really cute little website for kids teaches them music and all kinds of things and so I've had an opportunity to do some voices but um, I would love to be a cartoon that would be great okay vision board do you do vision boards um not not specifically no I, I'll write down notes for myself or you know write down challenges but you know I, I guess in that sense I do <laughs> oh cool. so you journal Type, like a form of journaling? No. Um, periodically, you know, I will just write certain things down, things that I want to throw out to the universe, things that I think that I would like to do. Um, and so that, I think that's about as close as I, I get to that. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I understand. I, I, I'm always curious to learn about um, different amazing professionals, how they their definition of success attraction, whatever it may be. So there's always great nuggets that you pick up from, you know, people along the way. Right. And, and every person is different. <clears throat> and everyone is different. And, and, you know, not all of us. One of the things that I think is really difficult about trying to be in the arts, being in voiceover or anything like that um, during this, you know, in, in our digital culture is that the system is, is different. And, you know, agents don't seem to play as big a role. Now they do in the major markets, but um, they don't play as big a role as they used to. And so much voice work, voiceover work now has gone non-union. There's a lot of work being done on pay-to-play um, sites on the web that it really puts the burden, the onus on the individual talent to market and promote themselves. Now, that's not something that we used to have to do in the past. It was up to our agent, and that's why it was really, really fun. <laughs> we would just have to, you know, we'd go to auditions, of course, but um, when it came to, we didn't have to, you know, put it on, you know, a ton of social media. We didn't have to, you know, get it out there and, and put ourselves out there every single day because our agents were doing that. So the business has, has really changed radically. Are you doing your own social media management? Well, my son helps me a lot. My son has a very good friend who has a company called Fanbase. And um, so my son really does help me so uh, manage social media a lot and uh, I, I have um, over a million Twitter followers at this point and, and we're building up the Facebook and Instagram and that sort of thing uh, because that is part of our business now mm. uh, in fact there are I even had an opportunity to uh, audition for something and the only reason I had the opportunity was because of the number of Twitter followers I had that is and, true isn't it yeah. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, for instance, if it comes down to, you know, the company can't decide between two different actors, you know, they'll look at the social media numbers and go with the one with more, you know, because then they'll automatically just have more promotion and marketing, you know, with that person. So the business has really, really changed a lot. Well, the good thing is you're, you're remaining flexible and going with the flow and making it happen. Trying to. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. You're a great example. With that being said, I would, I'm would. i just curious to know, how do you balance the unexpected highs and lows of your career? Well, I'll have to say that that does remain um, a bit of a struggle because it, there's something about us humans that when, when things get really slow and they stay slow for a little while, uh, we go, oh, that. I'll never work again. <laughs> but you really have to have that, that deep faith um, that that you will work again. And you really just have to be your own best cheerleader during those times. And those times will happen. Um, there's a very interesting documentary out there uh, called um, That Guy in That Thing. And it refers to a lot of character actors whose faces we all know, but whose names we do not. And one guy was saying, well, you know, gee, one year I had, I had three steady gigs. I was, was on three series, steady series, and man, I thought I had it made. And he said, uh, you know, in, in uh, almost no time, they killed off one of my characters, and, and the sh next series was canceled, and something else happened to the third. And all of a sudden, you know, he was used to just, you know, working all the time, and all of a sudden, everything just changed. And he said he didn't work again for 18 months. Whoa. So it's, you know, it, you, as much as it's hard to accept not taking it personally, because it is personal, it's your own livelihood and it's what you love to do, and it's hard not to take it personally, but you can't take casting personally um, because there are so many gifted people competing. And, you know, you just never know what little tiny thing that casting person hears in a particular voice as to why that person is chosen and the other people are not. And, uh, you know, you just have to keep at it. That's the key is just to keep doing it. Learning is a journey. Absolutely. It's so a journey. With hindsight being twenty twenty, is there any 
um, like professional moment or anything like that that you think like, oh, maybe that could have been different or, oh, I'm happy I seized that opportunity or I don't know, anything come to mind? Yes, there's one thing that I do regret, and that was, you know, oh, this is years and years ago. Um, I had an opportunity to audition for a, a big spot in New York City, and this was, you know, before we were doing auditions uh, via computer. And, you know, I had a young child at the time, and, and a good friend of mine said, oh, you would be perfect with this. You ought to fly up there and try out. And I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And uh, I wish now I had. But see, those kinds of things are things that you learn as you as you go along in life. And you learn to <laughs> sometimes just close your eyes and plug your ears and jump. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Figure it out along the way. Right. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so is there any um, memory from, like, from you doing, being an actor, or be, yeah, being an actor or an actress and... Um, that just make, just makes you smile when you look back on things. You know, I'd have to say that probably the most memorable things for me came from my singing career because I sang backup vocals with Roy, Roy Orbison for two years. And I also went on tour with Burt Bacharach. And uh, those were two very big highlights in my life. Um, as far as voiceover work goes, there used to be a production company in Atlanta called Cat's Paw Productions, and they were so wacky and so uh, forward-thinking. And they did it. They're the ones that I sang this, did the singing chicken for. <laughs> so, you know, they were they were very creative and, and very um, no-holds-barred, and so it was a lot of fun to work for them. Memories. Yeah. I, I like to say memories for the rocking chair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and listening to your TED Talk, you were you shared how it took you a couple of years to um, to share the face mm -hmm. of, of Siri. So I was just curious, like, is that something that you continue to have to address? Because, you know, some people, they like that, you know, people don't know who they are, but they they know this, you know, their voice or their work or however, but they still get to have their privacy. Um, so, I, so I don't, is that something that you have to, um, encounter or is it a, a non factor at this time? Well, it's, it's, was a factor for me when I was trying to make the decision as to whether I would reveal myself as the, the original voice of Siri. I knew it was going to impact my career and I wasn't exactly sure how. Um, and that's why, uh, I was a little nervous about it because when you do the type of work that end, that, that ended up being Siri, which is, you know, text-to-speech work, uh, messaging, that sort of thing, you are an anonymous voice because when people are listening to your voice in those, in those particular circumstances, they aren't listening to the sound of your voice. They're listening for information. So they don't notice and go, oh, gee, she sounds just like the, the woman I heard on the such and such. No, they don't even pay attention to the sound of the voice. All they're doing is getting the information. You know, what number do I what what number do I press to get the person I need to talk to? That's what they're listening for. And so that's why when all of us who had done the uh, the work that became Siri uh, found out that we were Siri, it was a bit traumatic because we lost that anonymity because suddenly when people, when that same voice becomes a persona and becomes a part of, you know, uh, everyday, people's everyday life and a, and a very significant thing in the culture, then suddenly you do not have an anonymity anymore. So that was a, that was a big uh, decision maker for me. I'm basically sort of an introvert. And um, so I really was not interested in having my privacy, you know, invaded. <laughs> and, and uh, but on the other hand, um, I think you have to, I think you have to seize opportunities. And it, and it finally, I realized, Oh, I, I can't pass on another opportunity like this, like I did in that, that time, not going to New York. So, um, that's why I ultimately decided to do this. Do you have a mantra, Susan, a quote that drives you? I have four ideas that I embrace and remind myself of every day and, um, gratitude, 
love, acceptance, and faith. And I don't necessarily mean religion. Um, all of those things, if you can, if you can start off in a positive way, um, being grateful for what you do have. You know, I think part of our culture, the, the part of the unpleasant part of our culture is that we really feel this horrible need to compare ourselves to other people. And particularly for young girls trying to make them, you know, everybody wants to look like, you know, the, the latest uh, model. And, and you know, guys have, have pressure in their own way. And I think that you have to really understand that you are on your own individual path. The person you should be competing with is you. And, you know, you can always do better. And so try to make yourself do better, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's very negative for us all to be competing against each other in certain circumstances, certainly not in sports. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Because I think it can be very negative. Not everybody operates at the same pace and not all of us achieve what we hope to achieve by a certain age. And I think you have to really give yourself permission to make some mistakes and learn from them and keep moving on until you find your place. What would you tell your younger self if you can do it all over again? Um, don't overthink this. Just, you know, jump jump first and then think think later. <laughs> Which will never happen with my personality, but, <laughs> but, I, but I do try. <laughs> So a little more adventurous. Uh, yeah, a little more. Take take a few more risks, yeah. High five, high five. Mm-hmm. Love it, love it. So if you had to describe yourself in your legacy in one word, what would it be? Oh, wow. That's the tough question. That's the question that I really am not sure how to answer. Okay. Uh, a legacy. Well, uh, I would hope that it would be... Uh, forthright and um, a person that you can count on. Nice. Yeah, I yeah. think that's it. <laughs> Do you have any parting thoughts for our for my listeners? I know they're going to be so happy to hear this interview. Well, um, I think I basically said it all when I was describing the little, you know, your, the mantra section. Yeah. Um, I guess the probably the most important point is if there's something that you really, really want to do, keep at it. You know, don't necessarily give up your day job, but keep at what you're trying to do. Um, just don't quit is the main thing. You know, just don't quit. If you keep at it. I saw some interview with um, Eric Stone Street saying that he'd, bumped around in Los Angeles for 12 years and he would, you know, be a guest on some TV shows and stuff. And he bumped around for 12 years before he got that role in uh, Modern Family. And so, you know, it takes, sometimes it, you know, I mean, Lana Turner was discovered at a, you know, a a soda shop or something and, and became famous. And so for her, it was instantaneous. But for most people, you really do have to go through a process and, of course, if you're trying to be in a show business in some way, it's always best to, to get as many skills as you possibly can. If you want to be a voiceover person, learn to read. Get, improve your vocabulary. Um, be able to read, you know, be able to sight read. Be able to read different passages in certain amounts of time because if you're going to get into commercials... 30, 30 second uh, commercial, they'll usually, usually write about 35 seconds of copy <laughs> and you've got to try to fit it in. Yes. Um, so, you know, you can work at it by improving your all of your skills, any any skills that you could have, you know, to, to, to bring to the table. Great feedback. Thank you so much. Listeners, if you want to get in touch with Susan, please visit her site, SusanCBennett.com or follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Seriously Susan, S I R I O U S L Y Susan, Seriously Susan. 
And you can find me, Michelle Beatty, at CareerTipper.com and on Facebook and Instagram at CareerTipper and on Twitter at CareerTipper1. If you enjoyed this episode or any other episode of the podcast, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Thanks for joining today. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it.